Here we disclose not one, not two, but three massive prophetic events that are sending shockwaves throughout the region, so buckle up for an exciting ride. Tensions in the temple are rising, and a stunning Messiah sign as shown at the famous Siloam Pool, so stay tuned for this prophecy alert. This is your chance to be a part of history and learn the truth about Israel's uncertain future, so don't let it pass you by. Are you ready to learn about the incredible prophecies being fulfilled in Israel at this time? Let's begin! Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel's longest-serving prime minister, claims to have successfully assembled his next government, which will likely be the most conservative in the Jewish state's history. Just before the midnight deadline that would have seen his mandate to assemble a government expire, Netanyahu called President Isaac Herzog and announced, I have a cabinet in hand. After 18 months in opposition, Netanyahu, a divisive and merciless political operator, will be sworn in as Prime Minister of Israel late next week, or at the start of the new year. After five elections in three and a half years, he will be sworn in for his sixth time as Prime Minister, continuing his more than 10-year reign over Israeli politics. With anti-Arab ultranationalists and outspoken homophobes among its ranks, Netanyahu's new government is sure to make waves. Netanyahu has agreed to promote Belzalel Smotrich, a staunch advocate of Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian area, to the position of finance minister, and this has already been made public. A second cabinet position in the defense ministry will be granted to Smotrich's extreme religious Zionist party, giving him broad administrative influence in the occupied West Bank. Smotrich, who openly declares his homophobia, supports the annexation of Palestinian areas. Israeli settlements in the occupied territory are widely condemned as a violation of international law. Itamar Ben-Giver, another ultranationalist leader, will be appointed by Netanyahu to serve as National Security Minister with enhanced responsibilities. Ben-Giver, who was found guilty of inciting racism in 2007, will now have control over Israeli police and border patrol in the West Bank as a result of this. In addition, he seeks to remove barriers to Jewish worship at the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in Jerusalem, also known to Jews as the Temple Mount. The Noble Sanctuary, or Haram Ash Sharif, as it is known by Muslims, has frequently been a flashpoint in the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Chapter Third Temple The next major event in God's prophetic schedule is the rapture of the church. The rapture will happen regardless of whether or not any future prophecies are realized. It's on the horizon. It's possible at any second. In reality, nothing except God's infinite patience and mercy keeps it from happening at this very moment. One of Jerusalem's most revered rabbis, Rabbi Nachman Kahane, 75, is confident that the temple will be constructed on the Temple Mount during his lifetime and that the necessary materials are already on the site. The first Jewish temple, erected by King Solomon on the Temple Mount, stood for 390 years before being destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. The second temple, constructed there during the Babylonian exile, lasted 585 years until its destruction by the Romans in AD 70. According to God's prophetic word, the Antichrist must govern the globe while the Jewish temple is still standing. To this day, the rebuilding effort is led by those who were trained by Rabbi Kahane, whose pupils established the Temple Institute in the Jewish sector of Jerusalem's Old City in 1987. The Institute has amassed all the tools necessary to build a temple, including the Table of Showbread, Altar of Incense, and Golden Menorah, and has prepared men for temple duty. The menorah is wrapped with 95 pounds of pure gold and is said to be worth $2 million. It is currently on exhibit in Jerusalem, facing the Western Wall Plaza. For example, a carving on the Arch of Titus in Rome appears to show the original menorah, a seven-branched candelabra, which led many to believe it was taken to Rome following the destruction of the Second Temple. There is a chance that Rome is still home to the first menorah. It was painstakingly recreated by the Temple Institute. When the Ark of the Covenant was last seen in Solomon's Temple, it was placed there, and the Temple Institute is confident that it knows where it is, in their pursuit of constructing the Third Temple. To familiarize more Jews with the holiest of Jewish locations before the future temple is erected, Temple Mount Heritage Foundation Chairman Rabbi Yehuda Glick offers Jewish trips onto the Temple Mount. Recently, he led a group of ten paratroopers from the Israeli Defense Forces on an educational tour of the Temple Mount, making it the first time in a decade that uniformed IDF forces had visited the holy site. 
Those who serve in the parachute regiment have a unique relationship to the Temple Mount, as explained by Rabbi Glick. That hill was captured by Israel in the 1967 Six-Day War, which ultimately resulted in the city of Jerusalem being reunited under one government. The Muslim waqf controls access to the Temple Mount, preventing Jews from praying or visiting the site in large crowds at the holiest location in Judaism. Israel, in an act of goodwill following the 1967 reunification of the city, handed control to the waqf. Rabbi Glick has issued a plea to the Jewish people to come together and devote their attention to the reconstruction of the temple by visiting this holy site. He oversaw preparations for the Temple Institute's renovation for several years. Gershon Solomon's followers on the Temple Mount are prepared to begin construction with a cornerstone in place. It was supposedly fashioned out of diamonds and blessed with water from the biblical pool of Siloam. Men who claim descent from the tribe of Levi and the priestly line are sent to a training camp near Jericho in the Jordan Valley, where they learn the skills they'll need to serve in the coming temple. In its 25 years of operation, it has trained tens of thousands of people from all continents. The majority of the priestly robes have been made and put away for later use. When called upon, Rabbi Kahane, the first recipient of priestly clothes, has his hanging in his closet. This clothing was the result of several years of study. There was a lot of international travel involved in getting the right colors for the costumes, such as going to Istanbul to get mountain worms, which are used to make the right shade of crimson, and importing special flax and thread from India. Since the collapse of the Second Temple, the formula for the perfect shade of blue has been lost, until the Patil Tekelet charity organization pinpointed the culprit as the Murex trunculus, also known as Hexaplex trunculus, the banded dye murex that lives in the waters of the Mediterranean. In addition, the skilled artisans at the House of Harari are nearly finished making the 4,000 harps required for the Levites to play the music in the temple, as commanded by King David in 1 Chronicles 23.5. While Rabbi Yoel Karen is confident that the third temple will be built according to the specifications laid down in Ezekiel 40-46, he also thinks that the Jewish people would first build a less lavish edifice, as they did with the second temple 2,500 years ago. According to God's prophetic word, the Antichrist must govern the globe while the Jewish temple is still standing. The Jewish people, who will remain true to God and refuse to worship the Antichrist, will be expelled from the Temple Mount again when he desecrates it. Jesus' Olivet Discourse is the definitive confirmation of Daniel's prophecy. The abomination of desolation, as he put it, has not yet occurred, he claimed. One day, the Messiah, Jesus, will return to Jerusalem and construct his temple on this holy ground, and from there, he will rule the world as king during the millennial temple. In chapters 40 to 46 of Ezekiel, the prophet describes the temple in exquisite detail. So far, no structure has been erected that matches Ezekiel's vision. Not the tabernacle, not Solomon's temple, not Zerubbabel's temple or even Herod the Great's wonderfully restored temple. The temple, that must be functioning in the middle of the seven years, known as the time of Jacob's difficulty, will not be the one currently under construction. The Muslim Dome of the Rock, with its golden dome, stands in the way of the construction of a third temple on the Temple Mount. Although it is not a mosque, this structure has Islamic roots. There have been suggestions that a Jewish temple may coexist with it on the Temple Mount. As for how they intend to bring this about, they claim to be unaware of any. This is something they intend to leave up to the Messiah, but they will be prepared to begin building as soon as he gives the go-ahead. Chapter Siloam Pool Messiah Ush Pizen is a fantastic film on contemporary Sukkot. The family's uninvited guest casually chopped and devoured an e-trog, a costly citron saved for the Jewish holiday of Sukkot. No wonder he didn't understand its meaning. The film's English subtitles do a decent job of translating the Hebrew dialogue, but it's up to the audience to figure out what's going on with the film's depiction of the customs surrounding Sukkot, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. What a mystery the celebration must seem to people who are unfamiliar with its present practices, let alone its biblical roots. The original meaning of a feast was to remind people of something crucial. Tell the Israelites, on the 15th of this seventh month is the Feast of Booths for seven days to the Lord. All the native born in Israel shall live in booths so that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel dwell in booths when I took them out of the land of Egypt. 
you shall know that I am the Lord your God, according to Leviticus 23, 34, 42, 43. God's deliverance of his people from slavery and provision for them in the wilderness was commemorated through Sukkot. Today's Jews still follow these traditions to the letter, with the Mishnah providing a detailed account of how to build a booth for the festival. As harvesting was finally over, the biblical festival of Sukkot was the most joyous of the year. The people would thank the Lord for his provision and start hoping for the latter showers. The Hebrew word Sukkot are translated as booths or tabernacles in the English Bible. To construct their booths, the Sadducees of the Second Temple era followed the Bible's instruction to gather branches from leafy trees and willows, yet the Pharisees read the plants as symbols of the offerings that worshippers would bring to the altar. The rabbis settled on the etrog, a citron held in the left hand of the worshipper as the fruit of Leviticus 2340. The palm, the willow, and the myrtle would be in the right hand. Hundreds of thousands of worshippers visit the Western Wall in modern Jerusalem each year for Sukkot, many of them carrying the four species. This year's Sukkot is near the Pool of Siloam, where Jews celebrate the festival of additional sacrifices of sin offerings and burned offerings were also called for at the Feast of Tabernacles. Although just a small fraction of this bottom pool's length has been uncovered thus far, the north side is completely exposed. The people had sung Isaiah 12.3, so you will cheerfully take water from the springs of salvation. On that day, that is, during the millennial kingdom of the Messiah, Isaiah predicted what Israel will sing about the Lord. Isaiah 12 could be read in light of that situation. It packs a punch in just six verses. Every person who puts their faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins can get this same salvation today. That's all for the video. We will be right back. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.